<clears throat> good morning and good evening to everyone wherever you are as per your time schedule i am going to talk on malaria elimination and whether we are on the right track the malaria elimination concept was designed when the cases started reducing because the basic concept of malaria elimination is to reduce the cases so that there is no indigenous transmission going on in this area now if we try to analyze the data of malaria worldwide and see the world malaria report according to the malaria estimated cases in 2010 that is 10 years before it was 251 million which was reduced to 231 million 2017 and the same reducing trend was maintained in 2018 which was as per world malaria report 2019 it was 228 million now in this there are who regions like african region has contributed maximum 93% that is 213 million cases whereas southeast asia region has contributed only 3.4% but the main crux of the problem is that india contributes maximum in southeast asia region so far as the disease burden is concerned similarly for east mediterranean region it is 2.1% contribution and the, the 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 good note is that the who southeast asia region it continued to show the incidence declining rate and the evidence is that the cases which were recorded incidence case in this 17 cases per 1000 population in 2010 now it is only 5 in 2018 this shows a 70% decline to be more precise when we talk on indian scenario you see there are two maps i have shown one for 15 and one for 17 15 when we our concept started for malaria elimination and we came out with the new guidelines that was the base year which was considered for malaria elimination drafting documents and see the number of red color area these different colors are basically stratified area based on annual parasite incidence that is cases per 1000 population so you see the red number of cases you see this is a well established malarious area in which the red zones are showing above 10 api then the pink one is 5 to 10 api yellow one is 2 to 5 and then green one comes to 1 to 2 and then finally the, the lighter portion blue portion is less than 1 api so the first target is to bring out all the area under this color now if you see the progress in 2017 has shown that the red color area has declined has decreased considerably it means the higher api has gone down that is what is the concept of high burden area it should have the high impact and uh, another good thing was that average api of the country was sustained below 1 per 1000 population now if you see on the stratification of the of the country you see country has been divided based on api in three strata basically to get the final strata that is the zero strata so if we start from the lower one category 1 which is the green color there are 15 states and they have actually already showing below that threshold less than 1 api the second category is the pink color where there are 11 states these pink color they are scattered and they are those states where average api is less than 1 but some of the districts they are above one so in totality they may be less than one but in, even if one district or two districts are there and why this i am showing state wise categorization because in india health is a state subject and implementing agencies are the state so first we have to take the state and then we will go further down to the district level 
So the target has also been fixed accordingly. This the target was fixed for this to achieve 2020, which they have already achieved. This was for 2022. This they are they are they are trying, and their progress is very very significantly good. And then the highest category is category three, the red color zone. There are ten states, precisely northeastern states, and then in the central peninsula. So these 10 states they are showing high burden and there the average api is also above one and the districts are also above one all these three categorized states they have to be brought down below one api and by 27 and then by 2030 so next three years 27 to 2030 they have to show that they have been successfully preventing the re-establishment of local transmission of malaria cases. This was very, very, very important slide. And based on this, the districts have been stratified. I'll show uh, uh, the previous slide. I will come back again. Now, the, the same year 2015 data, if you look on that, the districts have been categorized and the category zero already they have achieved there is local not no indigenous cases that is 75 districts they were already there 448 districts were in category one that is elimination phase and then pre-elimination phase that is category two the pink color that is 46 and then the high 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 burden area that is under nine districts so this was the basics of district and accordingly the districts uh, states are classifying based on the Current data also they are they are trying to categorize the districts and then see which districts have achieved and which districts are yet to be achieved. Regarding malaria elimination process, the highest level commitment from our honorable prime minister Shri Modi ji was given a commitment. He pledged during East Asia summit. Following that, in 2016, the first book which came. That was a framework for malaria elimination. This was the main guiding document. And then following this framework, national framework for malaria elimination, the two important documents were brought out. One was national strategic plan. And then there was another operation manual for integrated vector management. So these two documents were released simultaneously by Honorable Health Minister during the 2017. And they are all available on our website. Now, what has happened basically based on the commitment pledge, bringing out the guidelines the financial resources have been increased almost double and the main tool which was taken now globally long lasting insecticidal nets their saturation to priority area has been already almost achieved now when we go for the strategy strategic implementation how to tackle those three areas to go and meet the target. If you see the green area, which is the lowest endemic area, there will be focused vector control instead of case-based investigation and treatment. For vector control, there will be a focused intervention. Wherever you find, you have to go and do that. Involve the village uh, health presentation and nutrition committees, panchayati raj institutions, and different uh, other schemes. Then there is the source reduction will be the primary thing, biological control. If you get some cases, there has to be in and around focal spray or space spray. Then there will be advocacy will be continued throughout the year so that people, they do not create the breeding sites and for site should be liquidated immediately. Entomological surveillance will continue <clears throat> in all the areas. Second category, if you go, there will be two rounds of indoor residual spray. Urban areas will see the antilarval operations because in urban area, the indoor residual spray coverage will be very poor. So as per the policy and the strategic plan, there is no um, guidelines for spraying indoor residual spray in the urban area. Though slum will be covered under IRS. Source reduction and biological control and focal spray will be as usual according to this. Advocacy and entomological surveillance will also continue throughout the year so that people's awareness is not compromised. 
<clears throat> now coming to the high risk area highest burden areas in addition to all other things source reduction biological control larvae siding the the the, the focal space spray and two rounds of irs llin has been added llin will be additional things which will be on priority though in this area also llin can be distributed depending on the feasibility and the use, usability of the community but here in this area it's a mandatory thing because people have to use both and almost it has been saturated environmental management will be taken care of insecticide resistance monitoring is on priority in this area though in other areas also sentinel cell sites are being fixed and they are doing resistance monitoring but in this area it's on it's on priority now to do this lot many activities are to be done and it cannot be done alone so you have to necessarily involve the different stakeholders and if you write count from the central headquarter to the state headquarter to the district to the p blocks phc and then coming to the community there are many bridges are to be are to be channelized and people have to know that these these area to be worked and those area and those activities are to be bridged and there has to be cooperation build up capacity build up ownership build up and then commitment has to be done so this looks very very complex but once it is start working the complexity gets little easier but first thing is to bring them everybody on board for better governance for better activity implementation for better strengthening capacity better guidance and better monitoring to see basically the impact our media friends and stakeholders different companies and different uh, uh, people who are involved different clubs different uh, societies at the village level at the block level at the at the district level they need to be involved they need to be sensitized they need to be told that what best they can contribute and to what quantum they can contribute so these are very very important thing this is the part of our strategic plan now how to achieve as i told you that first stage will be the contacting the community then the second stage will be there they are they are bringing once they are they are brought on your platform their capacity has to be strengthened they need to be told what actually what for we are there what for they have been called and what we are expecting them then the activities has to be coordinated for that a mechanism has to be told to them that to see what they, you are supposed to do if what it will help what impact we are expecting and how to report it how to document it how to channelize your activities or your performance so that people they are they, they know that this agency or this particular individual or community is doing or providing this kind of support so for that uh, guidelines are to be complied but guidelines also has to be made for different people in a different style the same style guidelines cannot be for the community for the ngos for the ashas for the blocks for the doctors for the no paramedicals so different type of guidelines or you can say that uh, Uh, standard operating procedures sops have to be made and then the reporting should be complete so that that this kind of activity makes this whole picture as a complex one now if you if you look the the implementation process and its progress in 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 major uh, two tools i have just given one example that if you look on the irs which was primarily mainly relying on ddt in that area northeastern sector the ddt see last 2015 onwards completely dependence has been reducing this is a good right and similarly the llin has increased now see llin has been increasing and reliance on ddt has been decreasing if you see the total sprayable population it used to be around 60 65 million but now of late it has reduced to 45 to 50 million out of that ddt covers only 20 to 25 million around 10 million by malathion that is organophosphate and then 10 to 10 12 million by synthetic fiber but there are three four compounds 
in synthetic pyrethroid group. Allyline has been almost saturated, so there is there is there is not much issue on that. The only issue is that when they are torn, the replenishment and proper distribution, and then monitoring of their use, because without their use, if mosquito nets or allyline are kept. Undulled, it will have no impact, but slowly, slowly people are using. Then you see the map, this area, which is contributing 90% of Plasmodium falcipera. This is very, very, very important area. And this spray or this LLIN distribution is mainly strengthened or intensified coverage is being done in this area only. This is about the resistance monitoring, which is very, very important for this area. You see, this particular area is showing complete resistance of insecticide. And this particular area is still susceptible to DDT. So this is basically a latest map, which shows the country context. And this is being monitored regularly. Now. Talking to a strengthening is very easy, but how to do it? What is what is your requirement? What how do you how do you how many people or what kind of people you require? So for public health entomologists and biologists are required for three things precisely: vector bionomics to understand the transmission in the local area, to monitor the insecticide resistance, which I have just shown, and then designing the appropriate vector control strategy or guide the policy makers, local uh, bureaucrats that look here in this area, this particular vector control strategy will be best suited. Public health specialists and medical experts are very, very important. And this is very important pillar for the whole program for parasite elimination by treatment. Is there any treatment, supportive treatment is required? Is there case management? Uh, complicated case management, whether they, they require hospitalization and what kind of, so it is best uh, judged by the, by the clinicians, by the medical experts, for the patients, and then they can see. And then they also do help in designing the national guidelines if there is any change required. These two broad category, besides that there are paramedical and frontline workers who are required for implementation of the program, for example, active and passive surveillance, door to door going or people are coming, then they should be available. Their immediate diagnosis and providing the treatment as per the national drug policy. Vector control, IRS, LLI, and larval source management, all these things they try to, they do the help in paramedical people and reporting is very, very important because the reports are generated by them only. Then later on, everybody here and here they only monitor and they analyze the data. And then these three categories basically are four categories. They require to be adequately skilled on, uh, their skill has to be updated on yearly basis. And then the financial resources for doing these activities need to be sustained. So unless we do this, it will be very, very difficult to, to strengthen the, the workforce and get the desired output. We also understand that there has been many, many challenges, especially in this period, COVID-19 pandemic area. And there has been documentary evidence, which was published in 2020 itself, that anticipated impact of COVID on malaria elimination. And the gist is that we are going to have an impact on surveillance, we are going to have an impact on logistics. We are going to have an impact on the, the, the human resources, absenteeism because of fear, because of their protection. So these three things, if it does not work properly, it will have a negative impact on the process which was initiated on malaria elimination. And this is not only for India, this is for, for global impact. But in this situation, WHO has also advised and WHO has advised that certain activities can be now initiated uh, in June, July, and then certain activities should not be done. Like should not be done means basically 
the entomological surveillance when you are trying to suck the mosquito through the test tube collection it should not be done night collection should not be it should be avoided you cannot go if the lockdown period it simply you just cannot go out so it is there's no possibility but even then if you look besides who guidelines if you see the the malaria elimination activities uh, in indian scenario in april 2020 this photograph was taken maintaining the distance the health department was allowed and they are doing this education system uh, education community awareness for the implementation activity may surveillance though it was affected almost around 23 24% overall impact is there but if there are fever the community workers who are already residing in the village and we call it an asha accredited social health activist so they are collecting the blood smear for the examination this spray also started in june though it was late by one week or 10 days but it is started uh, this this person is doing with the syrup pump there are some other areas where they are doing with a hand compression pump so the spraying also started and then july proper team movement was allowed and then they are going in the field and monitoring and taking the blood smear doing the advocacy and other activities also slowly slowly picking up but definitely the impact has been there on malaria elimination process the challenges basically which i was discussing during the covid pandemic was precisely on surveillance and surveillance usually we talk of epidemiological surveillance but equal importance is to be given for both epidemiological and entomological human resource diversion maximum was for the covid-19 and that did not leave the vector borne disease workers also because they are the main field workers who are working in the field so they were also taken but they they should be insured under is some of the places they were done some of the places they were under process so the the issue was that the risk factor was already there and this was a big challenge during this period skill development was very very difficult whom to invite how to involve how to assign the task for the different stakeholders but this is an area which will always have a challenge and for that we must invite the stakeholder different stakeholders as many people as they are committed but we have to develop a trust so trust building with the non health department and non health workers will be a big challenge which will require uh, uh, in a long way for the skill development and uh, a big big th thinking is required to change the mindset for that now the another challenge is adequacy of the skill research if these things are not done diversion and skill development and equal importance surveillance then you don't require but if these things are required to be done then definitely you require adequate skills human resource without that you cannot do all these things ad hoc arrangements will not serve the purpose to the desired level it will just give give some kind of performance integrated vector management is a skilled job it should not be entrusted to non skilled job like anybody who is doing some agriculture work should not be used for this if they want to be used the the proper training should be done for the integrated vector management they must know at least how to operate the pumps how to use the how to talk to the villagers for well lion for irs for larval source management and they should be able to understand what is larva and what is not larva so that they can show the people look here in your house there the, the larva is breeding so it means they 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 should be educated properly there is another challenge the new tools are coming up lot many tools like pvo nets or long lasting insecticidal residual spray operations so instead of 45 days or one and a half month you can go for 6 months or 4 uh, months or 5 months so the gap will be even one round can take care of the your epidemiological season so those tools uh, if they are under trial it should be expedited so that they are allowed by the statutory organization they should be registered for sale use and implementation purposes under the program 
there are different process but always it, there is a challenge that it can be expedited little faster way similarly for the for the new uh, larvae sites also they are coming up they are some of them on the pipeline they should also be taken taken care of outdoor transmission is a big challenge for malaria elimination outdoor transmission those mosquitoes which were known to be indoor rester and indoor biter they have changed their habits and they are coming as an outdoor rester or outdoor biter this is one then there are many mosquito vectors which are already outdoor transmitting outdoor malaria and this has always been a big challenge with these tools available like irs and llin so there has to be again change of the mindset how to tackle them and this is not only for india this is worldwide this challenge is being taken there are many many other challenges uh, residual fossae uh, vivex malaria is coming up a big challenge so there are challenges and uh, that is why i have just marked red as a challenge and what can be the possible solution according to my ideas then as i discussed the mindset of the people for seeking treatment from the private sector this is a very very big this needs a robust reporting system that wherever you are going first thing the service provider the doctor or the paramedical they must follow the national norms number 1 number 2 they must provide the treatment as per the following national guidelines three they must report it because this is a notifiable disease now so unless they report it we cannot see the true burden and then assessment entire assessment will be going in a wrong direction so for that it should be mandatory and they though there are guideline though there are advisory though there are government circulars but people's mindset and the people who are doing the service their mindset is to be changed now optimization of vector control is another very important area that vector surveillance it cannot be done just like that ad hoc basis so you require specialist entomologist without entomologists entomological work cannot be done then up scale larval source management urban areas need to be covered under the very stringent bylaws without that you just cannot do it now program activities it should be synchronized and synergized and it should be based on the data evidence unless it is data driven decisions it will have problem in the long run so we should have data we should have analysis we should have competence to forecast the uh, the, the the problems and uh, tackling the cases based on that only programmatic decision should be taken and then financial resource as usual it should be taken as a as a as a primary thing that without finance nothing can move now at the end i would just like to say that though we have been contributing maximum earlier after the africa in southeast asia region but we have been making a big progress towards a very 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 appropriate direction towards malaria elimination but we continue to 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 sustain it provided keeping the fingers crossed provided the resources and workforce are given adequately to complete the surveillance and then only we will achieve so this all statement is in pursuit to achieve the goal of malaria elimination we have got 10 more years and we hope that we will definitely definitely achieve and that is why i have written in the thank you slide that we are confident at least i am confident of moving with this particular optimistic approach our approach has been very very optimistic thank you very much thanks a lot